misgivings as far as I'm concerned, the disappointment. Remember, they had officers that can did go to have to make way for them young guys to come from San Jose, something like Chan, Lastal, and all that fellas. Because when Lastal Rex, that was the bachelor, when they came down, they might have a little disappointment from that side. They might have a little input with the black power thing too, but I say it was a kind of island wide something, you know. They come down as second lieutenant. Rex was in my company, Alpha, and Raf was down in San Fernando at that point. But they were close, you can understand. They're like brothers, they're like brothers. So when they took over the bunker... Who led that exercise, taking over the bunker? Well, it was a set of private, you know, three or four private. They took the bunker, so confusion started to reign there a little bit. They cut down by the stores, they kind of took what they want. I was there with, well, now this is Warren Jeffrey, where I sat at that time. He was a staff that time, he was a DQ. The first salvo from the coast guard, they came wrong by the seafront. Right by the seafront. I will a little dive off the pier while there's a bay yeah. there, that area there. So they were flying across the square over the man room like to try to get at the bunker. Bunker, right. If you know down the body, you realize that the elevation of a gun barrel and the body building, they can't get at the bunker like that. So it's not to say that they were flying at Paracoom and not that they try, you were trying to blow the bunker. But by that time, everybody had ammo and all kind of things. Yeah, because you had to resource yourself. But they were firing and soldiers panicking. Some of them came out and went to the boat. So they couldn't get at the bunker and they say, well, it's better to evacuate the trundle. So a lot of the right how the majority of the fellas went on the truck. But when we were going over the hill, up by closeness, and we started to go towards the stovals media, the boats come wrong and started to fire again. I don't know if there was fire in direct, but as I said, the angle wasn't conducive to hit the vehicle. So I don't know if they were trying to hit the vehicle or trying to hit the hill, to bring down the hill to make the uh, way impossible. So after the time, we came out the truck, and what they can cover now. So at that point in time, that I we go hit Bailey on the helmet. I was right there. Then I remember they wanted to fire on the boat because they were within range of the mortars. We had mortars. And I remember um, they went to load the mortar, 81. Gordon, they do fire on the boat. They got others to fire on the boat. But under that amount of firing, we had to withdraw. We went back into Tetford. While we were down there, a plane flying low. And it was fired upon. I know that because I saw two trips back puff a smoke about it. I just went. Sometime during that period, I remember Mao Pitis was on the ram. He came down there. And Jeff Sarat, they called back Jeff Sarat to come down to talk. And he came down and he talked to them. After that time now, they started to arrest people or, or detain them. That is when they went to Cha and La Salle. Because the talk had come around that they had soldiers by the gate preparing to invade the front part. I don't know how that would have worked out. Because I had my back and my friends and them in Ogden. Some fellas had their relatives and things. So I don't know how that would have worked out. Because in any case, if they had to country run over the front, people had to defend themselves. However, thankfully, that didn't work out. I think they give the soldiers police shoots and all kinds of things. I wouldn't know about that. But I know it happened that the soldiers go the police shoot at him because they wanted them to differentiate them from us long and touch on. Because they say we were rebels, which wasn't quite true in my opinion. Who arrested the men? But the bus is to come down and they carry out. And this arrest went on for a couple of days. Eh? I remember um, even up that time when um, this is Colonel Theodore came down from Jamaica. He was there. And they have us doing quickie and things now, you know? I remember playing football on the sports team. And the bus came. And the only two people who remained on the spot till when the bus left was I and Lance Ward. They went with everybody. When everybody was taken, they formed the HQ up on the base. Where you saw the TTI up there, that unit was formed about that time. It ended up now with 10 people told. Full force, so when you go out, sometimes when you go, you go three, four days, you walk in your hunting because they would have who they wanted already, who was for trial and all kind of things. They were looking for who with the patrol? Based on the um the Black Power movement, fellas like Guy Harewood and Lennox Daniel and all them fellas came out. Mm-hmm. Those are the guys we were looking for. There was um the National Union of Freedom Fighters, so we had to do patrols trying to get those fellas. That is when the army started to work really with the police. I would say from 1970, 21, that is when we started to work closely with the police. 
I remember I have some fellas who was in my section who remain my friends. Police men who remain my friends up to this day. These patrols, how long did they last? And when did things would you say got back to normal in the minute? Those patrols last from 70 right down to all 82, you know, because even though it was scaled down after 78, we still didn't start to go on to patrols. We even started to do more vehicular patrols. We used to have a combination of bush and vehicular patrols. So Bego was always kind of out of it. was more challenging thing to me. Okay. But we had, as again, I said, based on that, we started to turn out to a lot of the big ones. But the hot spot was Trinidad, especially in the northern part of Trinidad. 20 patrols in the northern. Or like 90, it was more oh, disturbing, especially in the initial stage of this thing. Because when you're telling me that I have all my friends out there in Ogden who will meet and will lie, and then you're telling me that they had to come down to Petron to annihilate me. I was a person. <laughs> and yeah, that kind of disturbing kind of thing. Some of the fellows who were arrested were released and some eventually came back and finished the time in the army. At first they were arrested at random. You know. I remember they say I was driving a jeep. But as a lucky thing, I was a storm and captain half five who was my two IC. And he knew, he knew I don't know how to accelerate up my brick very like they must come behind that vehicle that passed at that time and like it. <laughs> so when they came, he said no, he's staying here. I remember after everything was over now. When Brigadier Sarat came down, I was responsible for giving the commanding officer um, a breakdown of all the arms in Tetron. So I had to go from store to store, check all the books, because of course there were arms listed and things for the fellow to get arrested and all. So it was an uh, easy time. You could not leave camp. First to begin, when the thing happened, in Tetron you can't come out. And then when it was over, they gave me a couple of hours just to run home and come back. It was not an easy time, very stressful. Of course, he had the men who like alcohol while well, they were in the canteen. During the law, before they came to arrest and when they were thinking about coming to take over Tetron and all kind of thing, we were down there. They were in touch with nobody. Maybe the senior people were in touch with authorities outside, but as a other rank, they used just then in the back room, you understand? So as soldiers, they do no guard because they had to um, guard the camp. So they uh, have systems in place to make sure the camp secure. That picture up a minute so people could see, doc, um, I call him doctor, well, uh, retired regimental Sergeant Major Modest, what he looked like back in the day in all his glory. Gentlemen, I'm looking at you sitting in this studio here. And, you know, I, I remember when I enlisted in the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment, you all were people that we looked up to. And we still do. Um, Mr. Modest here was our, my platoon sergeant. And for those of you who were part of my lectures recently or, or before, you would always hear me refer to him as my grandfather because he's, you know, in charge of us, apart from our second commander. And, um, you know, he was just that, a grandfather, and he still is. Every Sunday as I come off the air, I tell people, don't call me, let Samaj I call first because he calls me first. From the time I come off air, right in studio, heavy phone ring, because he was that just, just that to us, gentlemen. I am so proud to be sitting in the same room with you all, and to thank you all for the respect that you continue to give me and us for the work that we're doing, so that you can give us of your time this morning. Listening to Jones and Samuel, I see you all been conversing. It brought back a lot of memories, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, I remember in 1970, Lou, well, we don't do, as I said, we could not, we could not have leave, we could not, we could not leave camp. Right. Because for some reason, some people carded us as rebels, our rebels, which was untrue, of course. Right. I remember Lou. I don't know if he could remember this. He went to, he liked to dive, so he went to dive for fish. Spearfish. Oh, for, yeah, he went to spearfish, hoping he could make some broth or something. And then he came up suddenly. So I asked him, I asked him, I said, what happened, push us? <laughs> <laughs> he said, he saw a barracuda that was just the same length with him, and Lou, Lou is not a short man. <laughs> 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 I could have seen him like this. 
You remember things like that? Yes, yes. All right, or I'll always recall that football match when we when we were playing on the sports field. They had brought down this is um Brigadier um Theodore. Mm -hmm. He was holding the fort and encouraging us to you know do physical things to keep us occupied. Right. And we had this football match and they took the whole team. The only people <laughs> left was Lance Ward and myself. <laughs> I mean it was it was the real real heartbreaking. Right. And then he came on to tell us in a speech that the sword of the Macaulay's had stopped swinging. I don't know. Be, uh, at that point in time, they stopped arresting people. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lujo, Natasha cracked up every time she heard this part of your song. By when you say you by the seafront and you heard a shot, and then you say, eh, eh, shot fired. <laughs> every time Natasha heard that, she cracked up. But I was trying to explain to her, you had to respond like that because when you hear a shot discharge in a camp, in the office, you know something. It doesn't have that something. Some kind of accidental discharge. Right. Or, and most of the time it's caused by carelessness. Right. When I walk across there, I saw under the edge of the office, there are these kind of doors that with this with spring. Yeah, you push yeah. Yeah. I remember. So as a major Bravo company was Ram Narayan, and he used to play rugby. Mm -hmm. It's tough, tough in there. Yes, I remember and Ram Narayan. Ball head. I, when I watch, I see the, the, the feet on him on the ground and the head and thing, and, and I saw a rifle, and he kicking the rifle. So I bend on, I watch, uh, is he and La Salle. He holding on La Salle in a rugby tackle on the ground, and La Salle was over six feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taller than Ram Narayan, Ram Narayan was strong. Yes. And Ram Ryan held him down to the ground there and he kicked the rifle. He said, Jones, take that rifle, take it, take it. <laughs> and I pulled the rifle. I didn't know what the rifle was about, but when I hold the rifle, the barrel was hot. I realized oh. it, just, it was just fired. I realized as the rifle that fired the shot. Right. I didn't know what transpired. So in the corridor there, I had carried through the drill and take off the magazine. It had one round in, in, in the chamber, uh, release it. And that two rungs in the magazine. So it's three rungs in all. So I don't know who's going to fight war, make takeover place with three rungs. One was fired. Yeah. And I took it to the stores, which was on the other side of the corridor, the training ring stores. And I tell them, hold it. Um, Sergeant Major said, so I think it's all, hold it. And I, all I hear the Sergeant Major telling La Salle, sir, cool it, cool it, sir, cool it, cool it. And now you know the sweating. And you he raised up. And they stood up together and he hold him and he tried to talk talk with him. Well, I couldn't pay too much attention because that was above me. I was a private soul. Well, not only that, I'm just going to say that is not a common sight to see no. a warrant officer and, and a Sam major and an officer, commission officer, yes. in that kind of engagement. Yeah, the, LaSalle was my platoon commander. Yeah, you want to stick there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when, when we spoke with Franklin Brown, Franklin Brown said he was amazed to see an officer with his hands in the air. And a, and a pride pointing a rifle at him, mm -hmm. you know, he, he said, was a he said it was a western they were filming or something because he couldn't believe that actually happening in camp. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really shocking. To then, see then this old, this, um, it was a Lance Corporal, Fly, mm -hmm. Sylvester. Sylvester, Sylvester was his name. Fly came through the corridor, he came from the dining hall, he messed in, shaking in his hand, the aluminum messing, the used to be a yeah. to eat. He had it in, the, in his hand and shaking it. He said, what is going on here? What is going on here? I said, I know. So I go to look now. Both of us were looking. I saw Christopher, who was the OC at the time of Bravo Company, crying. Mm -hmm. Tears, because he was emotional. I don't know, and they kind of, this was consoling him. And then I saw Bob Allen there. They were consoling him. He came from another office on the other side. And I heard they say, Spencer coming, and he co I saw him come around the building. I said, "Well, this thing getting too big for me. Let me walk away." And then I said, "I hear they put him under close arrest." And then I heard that the Shah and Lasalle were outside the office, and they took them up. If you just I walk away, going, I saw Bazzi coming, and it's the first time I ever see somebody fitted with a camouflage jacket. Mm -hmm. so he had just returned from training abroad. And probably acquired that over there. It was not part of, of our ish, army issue yet. Yet, no okay. camouflage. Okay. And I saw him with that for the first time. I never asked him, well, how are you dressed? So 
Then I hear him say, they say they want me to go in Stubbles Bay. They kind of took to some man somebody across the island. But it turned out that he was part of the whatever they had planned. And, and whoever, yes, whoever heard about it, said they were trying to separate them that day. If you, if that, it, and they said that um, last I say he called on the men like Nori and all of them secretly and said, seize the time. Because that mutiny was to take place, as I heard, not that day, but, but it was coming, but sometime after. But they declared the state of emergency overnight. Right. So they say seize the time. And that is where they started mutiny. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Independency, and we are... Taking a trip down memory lane, if you're a student of history, you will, you're going to enjoy this morning. In studio, we have retired Staff Sergeant Lou Jones with us and retired Regimental Sergeant Major Gilbert Morris. And online, we will, they will join us in a, in a few minutes, would be Ray Admiral Kelshall and Colonel Wendell Solandi, two men who did their part in preventing the the, the 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 readjustment, I should say, of our our future entry in Trinidad and Tobago as a democratic country, it was really, really uh, uh, for them as young soldiers, as you would hear um, Jones and Mother say this morning, what happened. Now the convoy leaving to come over the hill. Let me before we introduce Rear Admiral Kelshall's contribution, we want to hear it from start to finish. Why? Because during a, 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 camp, a platform contribution by the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, he spoke about Commander Bloom. Now, a lot of people didn't know who Commander Bloom was. And, you know, we're not too good at documenting our history right. here, which is unfortunate. Um, as I said, every young soldier with their salt should know about this that happened. Because, you know, they don't forget his to repeat it. But you heard the, com the Prime Minister spoke about Commander Bloom. Commander Bloom was the, the man in charge of the Coast Guard at the time who Kel um, Rear Admiral Kelshall took orders from. Yes, he was a first lieutenant. Yes. So you're going to hear Commander um, Rear Admiral Kelshall's contribution. Gentlemen, we'd like you to follow this. Um, and you, the listener, follow it too as well. The regiment started it. This is the gentleman who ended it with his gunner and of course under orders from his commander at the time right yeah. so, so without further ado first natasha put together a nice video for you all to see to follow what happened on that morning when he captain spencer drove into Stobles and say they come in, they come in. But be aware that he does start um, by explaining an, an incident that happened some years before, which in which he was fired upon and had to return fire an incident with a pirate in the Gulf. And he, he mentions that story to explain how he himself had um, experienced fire. Um, and he was somewhat prepared for what he was about to engage in. But so, it still shook him. Of course. It still shook him as a young officer. Right. So let's go to that. Shortman, let's go. five or six the numbers in the coast guard were different to the army they started at 500 1963 the 9th of september so i was the fifth officer in the trinidad Tobago coast guard and the first officer cadet all the rest were short service officers and royal naval people that were brought i had a kind of normal career except i spent a lot of time as the adc to the governor general as a very junior officer and so i worked with sir solomon who tried and that is where I learned Trinidad and like going to a university, who was who and ministers, that kind of stuff. And then I was returned to duty in Stowellsby. And when I returned there, I became the first lieutenant of the HMTS Trinity, which was one of the VOSPA fast patrol boats we had acquired. A significant affair occurred during 1970, which I will mention because it puts a lot of things in perspective for me. And that is, there was a pirate operating in the Gulf of Paria. 
And it went on for months and months and months. And the heat and the public came up to the Coast Guard saying, what are you all doing about it? This man was shooting fishermen, stealing their engines, robbing nets. He was a terror in the Gulf of Paria. And the pressure mounted on the Coast Guard to do something. But we couldn't find this man. We looked everywhere, we patrolled, we never found him. And then one evening, a fishing boat arrived at Stogles Bay and the fisherman said, the pirate in Pelican Island, which is one of the five islands. And the commanding officer, Commander Bloom, said to me, take a little Boston whaler, a little dinghy boat with two men and go up there and just check it out. And I drew weapons and we went up, three of us. When we arrived at Pelican Island, there were two men in a boat and one man was up on the island with a pair of binoculars observing a set of Venezuelan traders going back to Korea. And just from the whole appearance, I knew that was a pirate. He was about to attack that set of traders and steal all their goods. And the two men were waiting in the boat. So I told the men in the boat to stop. They wouldn't stop because they didn't understand English. And they just start up the engine and take off. But I knew he was there. So I put my attention there. I fired at them, but no heroes, no heroes. I didn't hit nobody. A boat bouncing in the ocean, you can't hit nobody with that gun, especially a submachine gun. Anyway, I went up on the island, and while I was climbing up the island, I came under fire. And this man was shooting at us into the boat and in the sea. As the first time any Defense Force officer came under live fire. And it was a significant moment for me because I experienced this live fire coming up. In effect, I feel we ran out of ammunition and the man was still there with his weapons and the boat was there and the boat turned to come back to pick him up. I had two more SLR rounds, which the sailor had. I took away his weapon and I fired at the boat and both went okay. And the boat went back to Venezuela and left him there. But we had lost because those two rounds were the last and he was coming for us. So I had a flare and I fired off a flare and people drinking in the yacht club bar saw the flare and called Commander Blue. And the moment they called him, he knew. And it was like a movie. The whole Coast Guard came out of the sunset and the man was captured and whatnot. But the reason it's significant is the fact that I was under fire. And that put my head in a certain space because I didn't know what was coming next. So there we are. That brings us to April the 21st morning when the country was put on a state of emergency and the Coast Guard officers were told to be there at 4 o'clock. I reported at 4. I have to tell you, I've never been so scared in all my life. We knew what was going on from what we had been seeing and hearing. And I was saying to myself, not even the whole army and us and the police could stop what was going on. And so I was very, very scared. The first job I had was to go to a classroom with one sailor and the police had brought all the leaders of the Black Power movement and they were put in a classroom. And I was told I was in charge of them to keep them there and quiet. And I sat in the classroom with them for about an hour. And as time went on, they became more and more militant and frightening. They started to tell me about the trees that I would be hung on in Woodford Square and what they would do to my family and what people like me deserve. And then one of the more militant got up and he said, little boy, give me the gun. And I have to confess, I was frozen. I had with me a young recruit who had just finished training. And as the man approached to pick up my gun, he took the rifle and the bayonet and stuck it under the man's chin. And he said, if you sneeze, I'll blow your head off. He was so frightened that you could hear the magazine rattling in the rifle. But that incident made everybody sit down and not a word was said after that because they realized we were serious. They didn't know I was scared, but they knew that that young sailor was so frightened you would shoot anybody. So that is how my day started in a very frightening way. A little later on, a car drives into Stobel's Bay and then Captain Spencer jumped out of his little sports car and ran. We were in the yard in Stobel's Bay and he said, they come in, they come in. We have a mutiny in Tetra. He was bleeding from his hand where Rafik Shah tried to shoot him and he held the SLR with his hand and pushed it up and the flash guard burned all the inside of his fingers. So his right hand was raw and he had driven over the hill and arrived in Strobel's Bay. He said they were coming and Lieutenant Commander Mervyn Williams was the captain of the Trinity and I was his first lieutenant. And he turned to me and he said, Kelshall, put your ship at the action stations, we're going to see. 
So I ran back to the ship. We put the ship at action stations and he came running down the jetty, jumped on board, and we went round to Tetron. While we were in Tetron Bay, he told me to open fire. And I asked him what target, and he said the bunkers are somewhere up in the back there. Fired the bunkers because we had heard that they were trying to open the bunkers to get ammunition out. So I opened fire with the Bofa's 4060 weapon, which looks insignificant, but it's an anti aircraft weapon and it fires 120 rounds a minute, 40 millimeter round. They were fitted with what is called a grazed nose fuse because it was anti aircraft, which meant it would hit the thin skin of an airplane that would activate the fuse and when it got inside the plane shrapnel would fly in the plane and mash it up so we were flying over tetron bay up to where the bunker was trying to create a feeling we in charge here now stop the mutant it didn't work all that happened was there was mass confusion and soldiers started to run everywhere and then he said all right ceasefire it's not working a crop duster. The pilot who was already airborne heard on the radio there was something going on in Tetra. And he flew that crop duster about 20 feet above the hillside going along to see what was going on. And the entire set of troops on the hillside opened fire. And it was only by his skill as a pilot that he came out with the airplane riddled with bullet holes and went back the way he came. But when we saw that on the ship, we say, so are you still bad? We can show you what bad. And we let loose with the Bofa on the hillside. And this time, it was not me. They had Captain Bloom and Mervyn Williams, so I wasn't scared. Boy, did we fire that gun. We fired it so much that we had to pick buckets of water from the sea to cool the barrel. It was so hot. And the trees were just flying on the ground. We nicknamed the gun after that and called it the lawnmower. And an officer swam out from Tetron Bay to the ship and spoke to him. While that was happening, a boatload of sergeants trying to get out of there came out and the boat capsized right alongside the ship and a couple of them were drowned. Coast Guard men dived overboard and saved these two sergeants and we pulled them up on board. We came right back to Stobel's Bay and as a result, I think, of what the officer told Mervyn Williams, he just disappeared. We know now in hindsight that he went up the hill to his house where he was living and went down to Tetra. At the time, our Coast Guard aircraft was alerted way early in the morning and was circling on top of Tetron Bay watching and he reported to our headquarters there was a convoy and that the convoy was forming up and about to leave. This information came to our option and was told to Commander Bloom who sent for the captain of the Trinity but of course he was nowhere to be found and then the order came down to me you are the first lieutenant so I left the ship and I went to Commander Bloom and I said yes sir what would you like and I'm going to use his words he said Rich I want you to take that ship to sea and stop the army convoy. The first account? Yes, yes and part one. That's part one. Now they're going to make their way back to Stobles mm -hmm. after this. And this is when all the, the action and the interaction between the convoy and the Coast Guard took place. Again, this here is what changed the the planned course of history for Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, and we hear some of the conversations that took place on that vessel. On that vessel. Day, yes. um, and some of the aftermath as well. What what happened when Surat came down and had his talks and, and what was agreed that would happen if the mutineers agreed to the terms. Yeah. What happened if they didn't? So, ladies and gentlemen, we have in our midst, as I said, we'll be joined by Real Admiral Kelschel and Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Salandi in a moment. Let's go to part two of Real Admiral's contribution and what they did to prevent this convoy from leaving Tetron Barracks. Let's go to it. <laughs> And I was a bit of a rebel myself too. And I said to him, why you don't go and take it? And his reply was still in my mind now. He said, I could, but you're a trained idiot. And I'm not, and it's better that you go. I saluted him and I said, I will, sir. 
And then when I walked out, he called me back and he said, try and don't kill too many people. And I saluted again, went aboard the ship. I had never commanded a ship before in my life. I was the first lieutenant. This is the first time I had ever been in command of a Coast Guard ship. And I went on board, went up on the bridge, we backed off and I went out. And I never thought anything was going to happen. And then to my horror, there came the convoy coming over the hill. And his words were, stop it. So I wasn't far out. I was probably less than 100 yards from the shore. And I opened fire. I told the officer in charge of the gun to fire above the convoy and ahead of it so that nobody would be killed. Whether it is known or not, I disobeyed orders because the commander of the army was on the bridge of the ship next to me, Colonel Stanley Johnson. And I realized he had lost it and he was panicking. And I had great respect for a man in his position who was seeing his whole army mutinying and disobeying him. And his words were, kill them all. When I heard it, I said, I will not do that, sir. And I told the senior Coast Guard on the bridge, take this man below and put him in the commanding officer's camp. My job was to stop that convoy and David Bloom had told me, try not to kill me, which is contrary to the orders I got from Stan. So I fired above and in front of the convoy. Let me tell you something about the both of us. When a normal weapon like that fires, it makes one explosion. Because of the place I was firing, the gun went off and you heard the explosion. The echo went to Little Gaspri Island and you heard another one. It bounced from there onto Big Gaspri Island and you heard a third one. So every time one wrong went off, it was boom, boom, boom. Very low, very low. And the first three rounds I fired, you're hearing three echoes coming at you. And for an army that had never been under fire, that was the deciding factor. What capped it was I came under fire. That is why I mentioned the story about the Gulf with the pirate. And there was bullets hitting the water all around the ship. And I turned to my coxswain, who was a Bajan, a very brave Bajan coxswain called Heaps. And I said to him, Swain, this is a hell of a morning for the rain to fall. And he used to stutter. up. And he said, da, 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 there no rain. That is bullet. It was an amusing thing in a very serious situation. On the hillside, one rock had hit a tree and the shrapnel came backwards to the convoy. And a piece of shrapnel passed through young Private Bailey's helmet and came out the next side and he dropped dead on the road. And for an army that had not been in combat, that had not been under live fire, to see one of their comrades die in front of them, that was it. And the whole convoy stopped dead and reversed up the hill at speed. I felt a great sense of relief and thought, well, this is the end of this. As I was backing off, an ambulance started to come down the hill with a red light flashing and a group of people behind. Now all my training had taught me, you can't fire at an ambulance. An ambulance is sacred. So I stopped and I fired two rounds very high up, but the ambulance didn't stop this time. We had put the Coast Guard bus over the road and we saw them shaking the bus, shaking the bus and bumping it to move it. And I called Captain Bloom and Stobles Bay on the radio and I said, I help us here, I can't fire, there's an ambulance here and it's coming through. And when Bloom got that message, he says, right, stop what you're doing and come alongside quickly. So I took the ship, went back alongside Stobles Bay. He and Mervyn Williams, who had reached back from Tetron, jumped on board and a whole group of loyal soldiers and everybody who's in Stobles Bay piled up. And then I backed the ship up. Mervyn Williams again was the captain of the ship, except on this occasion, Captain Bloom was on board. So he was in overall command. And we went back off and he started to fire again, but not at the ambulance because nobody could shoot at the ambulance. Again, it was just frightening fire on the hillside and nobody took that on and the ambulance went through. The rest of the people hearing the Bofas again went back to Tetra. We think hindsight tells us they were in place along the roadway and the hillside with GPMGs, but the attempt to go out with a full convoy was finished. It was a very significant thing because the ambulance itself had all the spare weapons from Tetron Bay, hand grenades and whatnot inside of it. 
which is a crime against the Geneva Convention. You can't put weapons into a Red Cross vehicle. And that went into town. And apparently, as we heard, that convoy was going to go up to town and distribute those arms. And had that occurred, Trinidad's history would be totally different. It would have been battle against police, army. Plus, there was a whole group of loyal soldiers at the Shagorama Spain Gate, and that would have been a battle too. So the whole course of Trinidad's history could have changed if that convoy had gone through. So my initial action on the day now had finished, and we went out with Commander Blue. Meanwhile, the Colon Bay, which is the other ship, took all the prisoners who were the Black Power leaders to Nelson Island. So the Colon Bay was involved in that. And so I had my first command, and I did not, I'm very glad to say, kill everybody on the hillside because we've thought about it since then. And if that weapon was swept along the face of the convoy with all those soldiers in it, there would have been a bloodbath on the hillside. So only one man died. And as a result, Private Bailey is the hero of 1970. The sight of him on the road bleeding is what made all the soldiers go back. And so the action ended there. It didn't stop there. It went on for 10 days, but the main action had been done. Everybody went back to Tetron and they remained there for 10 days and many things happened. The Venezuelans came, we had to go out with the ship. We were so excited. The Venezuelans had a destroyer with a battalion of Marines on it and they were coming ashore. I took the ship, put it alongside the destroyer and Captain Bloom went on board and spoke to the captain. And when he came back, the ship turned around and went back in the Gulf. And we asked him what happened. He said, the captain wanted to know how many people were in Tetron. He wanted to know how many people were in the Coast Guard. He wanted to know how many people were at the main gate and everybody in the peninsula. And Bloom told him, and he said, good, that'll take us about 20 minutes to clean up everybody. So they were going to ask who was loyal, who was not loyal. They were just coming to clean up the mess. There's a lot of high political strategy, but it was an opportunity. But Eric Williams had the foresight to tell them, we don't want no help. And they went back down in the Gulf. They never left. They stayed just over the horizon in the Gulf there for the whole 10 days. Then another Venezuelan vessel came in and that created a complete panic in the Coast Guard because we thought that it was going to take Nelson Island and rescue the Black Power leaders. And so the people on Nelson Island went into full emergency. And our ships were placed around the island. But in fact, it wasn't so. The boat was coming through the Grand Boca and going down into Guria on standby. So many different excitements came. We remained circling the two ships between Stobles Bay and Gaspri Island for 10 days, really, until we were so tired we had to send to the hospital to get drugs, speed. And the doctor issued us these drugs to keep us awake. But even with that, after half an hour, we were falling asleep. And we were relieving them on the bridge. And the ships were at full emergency in case anybody tried to come out. It was worse at night because you really couldn't see what was going on. And we were there and nobody slept. Everybody watched the hillside in case another attempt to come out was made. On the final day, 10 days later, we were told that Serret was going in to negotiate a surrender. But we were told something else, that if he failed, we, the Coast Guard, were to go in to Tetron Bay and flatten it with both ships' guns. And we had a conference, and people were given a chance to back out and say, we don't want to be part of this. But it was so serious that Serret had a tremendous responsibility to get them to hand over the keys to the bunker, which was the signal that they had surrendered. And we had a code word between him and the Coast Guard ships, which were ready to go. And the code word came. They had two code words we were listening for on the radio. Everybody crowded around the radio. One was the washing is dirty, which meant we had to go in there and just blaze away. And the next one was the washing is clean, which means they had surrendered. And after about an hour, this voice came crackling through the washing is clean. And that, to us, was the end of the crisis in 1970.
step of what went down this, from um, course, this God perspective. Yes, on the anniversary. Nothing. Remember, this was this April 1970. Yep. And we have a video with us. And then we will we speak with the Admiral. And then we'll have the a man I have a lot of tremendous respect for, Wendell Salandi. We had you know, we speak with him afterwards. Re Admiral Kettle, thank you very much. We know you're out of the country, but thank you for giving us time. We have Lou Jones and Babel in studio with us. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Nice to be here. Yeah. Are you hearing us loud and clear? I am hearing you, yes. All, All right. right. So, um, sir, you yeah. just heard, you just sat, you heard your account. We, we thank you for giving us the opportunity for recording you and you recalling those events. Years later, how does it feel that you were a part of history? You remain a part of our history in changing the course of um you know of what the regiment attempted that morning how do you feel today well, the whole incident was one of, of tremendous fright because it's easy to see you have this and i'm that but under those circumstances the big thing was fair and you just carried out what was your duty and the spotlight never really came on because everybody said it was Captain Blue. And people believed that that was the case and they let it, they let it slide. It is only eight years later, in 1978, that Prime Minister Eric Williams got to know the truth. And he sent for me and gave me the Medal of Merit. And he said to me, there will always be a Coast Guard. And he was very grateful for what I did. So the period right after was not really centered on me. Now, Rear Admiral, um, I, I, I was fortunate to be presented with a, an article from another retired soldier. And I want to thank Troy Miller for this. But I want to show in this here, Dr. Eric Williams, and this is quoting from the article. Dr. Williams, on the other hand, did not want an army. He was in favor of a National Guard but was advised by Admiral Lord Lewis Mountbatten that, Mountbatten that as a member of the Commonwealth, it was necessary to have an army in the event of an attack by enemies and, of course, to get support from the United Nations. So, on one hand, Dr. Williams wanted, the, he, he wanted independence, but it came with a price. Mm -hmm. Could you just repeat that, please? Yes, no, I was just saying that, um, I was just reminding you, your good self and the folks listening and viewing that Dr. Williams did not want an, an army. He wanted a National Guard, but he had to because of the being granted independence or wanting to, to have independence. But that but, is true. The British, the British had advised that there wouldn't be a defense force comprising an army and a Coast Guard. Right, and um, but he was comfortable with the Coast Guard. But the, why do you think that there was this disparity there? I don't know. He didn't. I have to confess, he never gave the impression that he was fond of the army, and, hmm. and that only came about because he was instructed by the British at the time that to gain independence, he had to have an army. But had he been more interested in the army at the time, maybe what occurred didn't occur, wouldn't occur. I don't know. Hmm. Well, Mr. Kaltrol, what how I know you mentioned in your contribution about um, Clyde Bailey and his role, him being the only casualty. How do you think his legacy and his family's legacy should be preserved even you know, 50 plus years later, how, how should he have been remembered? But that is not for me to say. That is a, a government matter. But certainly Trinidad must know its history. And his death on the hillside there went a long way in stopping the actions that were going on. Yep. And uh, do you think that the military itself, the defense force, both the regiment and the Coast Guard have adequately documented the events of that day and that week 
for future generations of soldiers and sailors and air guardsmen? That's a very good question. There was a commission of inquiry. Hmm. Nobody heard that, never saw the light of day. Hmm. But it has since been documented by people that were there. In fact, books were written. Yeah. So the facts are very clear. And there's no, nobody has yet been able to come forward and say what was in those books is wrong. Hmm. And Captain Bloom himself, when he heard, because he was very friendly with me, when he heard that the fame for the shelling of the hillside was going to him, he actually came to Trinidad and had an interview with the Guardian. Mm. And he told me that he would clear up the, the whole business. So it is for anybody who needs to find out, they can just go for Captain Bloom's words, which were given in an article about two years after, where he came and he cleared the whole story and said what happened. Yep. Do you think that the Defense Force is pro, I mean, I'm putting it on the spot a little bit here, but do you think that they have, they're proud of what took place and they have put it in the, I mean, I know people have wrote books and stuff, but put it in its place in terms of not only our military history, but our independent history as, as an independent nation. Yes, but it's not being recognized. Now, the history has not officially been recognized by anybody. Mm. And, and that's not a good thing. It, history is something that the young people have to learn and grow up. And the action that took place in Tetron damaged the Trinidad to behold regiment. And it will always now be known as the regiment that mutiny. And yes. the people who were responsible for that have yes. not been punished or have not even apologized. And that's, that's a problem for Trinidad. People must realize that what went on there was a mutiny. That's the worst crime in the military. Hmm. And the consequences are very grave. And, and Trinidad, because there was this controversy and the army was a senior service, remember, Brigadier Saret took over the army and it was a senior service and he was a senior officer and it was forbidden to talk about 1970. It yeah. was pushed under the carpet and everybody refused to hear or even mention what happened at 1970, which too was wrong. Yes. Yes. Agreed. And what caused it? And what caused it? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's the problem. And um, Rear Admiral, before we let you go, we have in studio here two, two retired personnel, um, Modessa. I don't know if you're familiar with Modessa and Lou Jones. I'm sure you would be. Hey, For me, good. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I make him catch the first big kingfish in his life. Do you remember <laughs> that, that Rear Admiral? <laughs> Lou Jones. I didn't hear it too well. What was the comment? Ask him when he gets the biggest kingfish in his life. Uh, ask him. Lou Jones wanted told me to ask you when you, if you remember when you caught the biggest kingfish you ever did in <laughs> where that happened, Stobles? No. Outside Mona Island. Outside Mona Island. <laughs> Lou Jones. Yes, Lou and I go back a while. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Even then and, and after the mutiny. Right. And you see what, what we've done here this morning. This is another history making event. We have oh, Colonel God. Salandi, we have Gilbert Morris, we have Lou Jones in on the same program. And these were the loyal soldiers. And together with your good self and Commander Bloom, you all, as you said, you know, reshaped the history and changed the course of history in Trinidad and Tobago. And for that, we want to thank you, gentlemen, for the great job that you all did. Well, it is always so when people. Um tend to forget the real truth and, and what is glamorous they put forward. But the three fellows you're talking to there are also three heroes of 1970. These were men everybody respected and, and still have my respect. Right. And there are a couple of those there. In fact, I say that Private Bailey was a hero. It's a very trying circumstance. He was amongst the mutineers, and so that puts a dulling on it. But in fact, I believe it was because he was killed that everything went the way it went. But there were heroes that were killed and they're still alive and nobody, nobody looks to them or asks them anything. It's just like the whole incident itself. You know, it should be opened up for the whole public. Yep. You know, um, Reverend... All of these 
gentlemen and brave people would have come forward you know one more thing that i i would like i would like one more thing i would like to add to that um in country we know especially you know those that rich military history there's one a museum and also they 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 remember a certain day that something significant has happened and the 21st of april every year should be that day in the coast guard and the regiment for in in all that they should set aside for so let's who just join those of you i'm sure if you ask many people in the regiment right now what happened in 1970 they can't tell you mm -hmm. and and the coast guard and kelshall salandi everybody should be invited to tetron barks and stobles every 21st of april once you're alive so that you you can have that day of remembrance of some that happened who started it who ended it and, and give them history um shouldn't shouldn't we look at we be looking at something like that but then it's important to understand when within the military there's rivalry between services and that is a very real thing in fact in america the american army and navy have football teams and it is great rivalry and at the time of the, the playoffs that that which service will be beaten and so they develop a rivalry inside so it's not a bad thing we had a rivalry between the army and the coast guard but there's no requirement for it the coast guard start on april 21st 1970 and despite all the horror the army went through for the 20 some years after that the army saved the country in 1990 so they have their own day we have our day and both should be celebrated the army became a very famous army all over the world in fact they redeemed that black smear that rafik shah put on the army and so they ought to be very proud we agree agreed we agree agreed 100 percent and um Thank we so had much. Brigadier General Ansel Antoine General here. Redemption for the army. Yes, and well, we 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 hope that his book would be ready in that by that time, so that because there's a chapter in it, we really interested for everybody to hear is on Anthony Pomel or another retired um, regiment warrant officer. Warrant officer. And um, uh, it, it it's so we're looking forward to the release of that book because he has covered 1990 as well gentlemen before we let the admiral go anything you would like to to say to the admiral this morning well i want to i would want to wish the admiral long life good health <laughs> um always always respected him i remember i remember he was acting cds i was the rsm in komoto barks right and he came up there and after he spoke with the officers, he said, I'm awesome, let's go to your office. <laughs> so I we went to the office, he sat down, he tell his driver, he said, I have um two doubles <laughs> MAV, you can bring it. <laughs> so the driver brought it. So he sat down, gave me one, he had one. He said, Arasem? I said, yes, sir. You see, I spoke to all the officers and hear what they have to say. But it's you and want it's from you and want to hear what is happening here. I always remember. <laughs> I always remember. Uh, say, it's from you and want to hear what is happening. Lou Jones talk talk to the Admiral. My memory of uh, the Admiral is one of fun. Apart from our military uh, experience together, working under him at CDS. The day I remember most is the day he came with his, with his boat, his pirog. His wife was in it. She was a ardent fisher lady. She liked to fish. They used to fish around the coast and sing, and she we would be there fishing with him and most time catching red fish, red snapper. But he came by, by my boat and he said, and Jones, what all your anchor here doing? We were anchor in the first book us off Monas Island at a point they call Marielva Point. I said, we're catching big kingfish here. You say, you have kingfish? You seen any kingfish here? I said, they're down in the bottom, sir. <laughs> I said, so if you have a rod, you need big bait. I'll give you a bait. Just anchor a little bit away from me there and just put bait on, you know, on the rod and slack the rod and let your wife continue her banking by me and leave the rod alone. Uh -huh. 
his rod bend before I was <laughs> <laughs> and it started to, the reel start to sing. And he, I tell him I shout to him, I say, Well, you have one there, sir. I say, Yeah. I say, take the rod out the thing you hold it. He said, I can't stop it. I say, I'm coming along. I say, I'm coming alongside. We pull our hand up and I went along. So I tell him, jump in my boat. And he jumped in the boat and we drift down. I was using um, the Brigadier General Ralph Brown boat at the time. I said, take care of it. I eventually own it. And the Admiral sat down and um, stood up in the back of my boat with that rod and he said, this fish is not stopping. I said, it's all right. We drifting, going down the first boat, heading towards Scotland Bay and the Kingfish wouldn't stop. So you see, that is the size. We tell you that by him. Eventually, I tell him it slow down, start reeling it in. He reel it, he reel it, he reel it, reel it, and he was sweating. <laughs> and I'm watching at him, me and my friend in the boat, my fisherman partner. He said, um, Jones, come and help me now. I said, sir, I'm not helping you. You had to fight that fish. If you get away, you might blame me. I said, so go ahead. He reeling, he reeling, he reeling, he reeling. Eventually, he bring the fish, and I'm watching down the water clear, and about 90 feet of water. We, we were in the middle of the boat, because they're between Scotland Bay and Monas Island. And I looked down and I saw the fish shining coming up. I said, keep reeling, so keep reeling. He said, I'm tired. I said, you're tired. You have to rest. The fish take off a little bit and start back reel it, reel it, reel it. Eventually, he brought the fish within about 30 feet. I had a long gap. I had, had my hand hanging over the water on the side of the boat. I tell him, you see, you seen it? I say, no, sir, because I don't want him to look because I know if you see the size of it, you panic. <laughs> I say, no, sir, you just keep wriggling. Real, sir, real. And he's sweating. He said, Jones, you don't want to help me? <laughs> say, yes, he asked my partner, help me now. My partner said, not me, not me. So he did really bad. I know bad. I give my partner a little sweet eye. And I tell him, what go he, from my body language, my friend know that he's fishing here. I say, keep reeling, so keep reeling, reeling. And I just stretch my hand when it reach under the boat and I gaff it and I feel my hand shake it. And I raise it, I raise it up. And he say, you have it? I say, yes. And I drop it in the boat. Oh boy. He say, Jesus Christ. He say, that is the beast. I say, yes. <laughs> drop it in the boat. I carry him alongside his boat. His wife was catching a little red fish. I say, so if you have a big cooler to hold the size of that fish, I'll go because the sun getting hot. Hmm. It will spoil the time. He say, okay. I drop him off in this boat. I look at the fish, how the fish went. Eat fish east. Eat fish it lasted. But I remember that that is the one day that I remember my experience with the Admiral. I'll never forget that day after day. I'll remember it as long as I live. So we had he murdered, said that's you the biggest it. fish he ever caught. So His you... wife opened my eyes, big fish. So she said, we had fish when he threw it over in the boat. We had no catch up. So you heard the gentleman I'm proud of him yes. that he hold that fish for himself. It's nice we had sailors and soldiers <laughs> living in harmony and working alongside and playing it's alongside fun. each other. Um Brad Marcel, any closing comments from you? Well, you can't really make comments on a incident that is so big. What what should come out of it is a tighter defense force going about the business of the country and all these little interpersonal rivalries out of it, working hand in hand and to, to a great extent it's coming it's coming and, and that is a big thing take away from 1970 we have to be together and it should never happen again that one service has to turn against another service and, and I feel that I've seen the progress made and I've seen what the army did in 1990 and I know I'm right because it was a good thing that we had an army, despite the fact that they weren't wanted at first. But they ended up saving the country, and they have both units now can be titled with saving the country, and we can put this 1970 thing to rest. We hear you. Admiral Kelshall, we want to thank you very, very much for spending the time with us this morning. We really appreciate it, and we thank you for your service to Trinidad and Tobago and all the other sailors who would have contributed to you know, reshaping the course of history. God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving us of your time this morning. Right, Joe. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Take care. All right, folks, so that's it. Rear Admiral Kelshall, that was the man who you heard all that and of course donald muhammad who can't forget the gun the gunner mm -hmm.
who deceased, deceased Donald Muhammad, who was the man on the boat for that morning. Yes. 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 A foreigner working part time with Karani as a crop duster had heard on his wireless radio about the unrest at Tetron Barks. Being curious and wishing to investigate for himself, he headed west in his small crop duster plane and found himself over Tetron Barks. Having a small plane riddled with machine gun bullets and narrowly escaping with his life, the pilot, now very shaken and nervous, flew directly to Piaco Airport. And requested permission to land. Mm -hmm. There he left the aircraft and traveled to his apartment in Central in a taxi. A few days later, he was back at Pico Airport, only this time to board a flight back to his homeland in Europe, never to be heard from again. When we came back, when we came back to um Tetron Barks. Yeah. We were all in the the guard room. We still are doing our recreation. We, this is the plane. We were flying low over Tetron. <laughs> well, no, being, yeah, being in the, in the mental state that the man, uh -huh. they opened up. Yeah. I saw yeah. smoke coming up. <laughs> and this, smoke. this was written by Clement Bukit, ex soldier, true that the big regiment. Yeah, he was very lucky. 1966, he said. He was very lucky. Yeah, he had. Scary man, yes, he yeah. has never come back to the land. Man, never come back to Hey, folks, thank you very much for staying with us. You're listening to Annie Penancy, and we have thank retired. Thank you, Colonel, for holding on. We yes. are coming to you soon. Yes, let's take a break, and when we come back, we come back with the Colonel retired Wendell Landy. Stay right there. You're listening to Annie Penancy. And remember, you can join us on Facebook and YouTube as well. We'll be back. Tobago. I'm an attorney at law and also chairman of the Caribbean Committee Against Sex Crimes. Say 10 years ago, it was said, in, even in my country, that nobody should speak out about human trafficking because they will, will come to get you, you know, the, the mafia. Now that hundreds of people know about it and are speaking out against it, that darkness has been displayed and we're bringing the issue into the light. Schools across Grenada, St. Lucia, St. And the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, the students were really positive about it. They wrote poems, spoken with poems, they made videos. I've risen and believed. And this, those videos went on to the local media, onto the radio and television. On arrival, you are forced into captivity and a life of servitude. So the students were inspired to see their fellow students being connected to CNN International. A lot of kids now know the signs of human trafficking, what it is and how to avoid it. So we, we may have saved some lives. My Freedom Day helped raise awareness, educate children, and I hope it inspires politicians and the governments across the region to do more to stop this crime from happening. It's impactful and important, and we hope to do even better next year. Finally, welcome relief comes in the form of a scientific program that shows us how to manage through the tough, current challenges. Called Habitalism, it features best-selling author on positivity and happiness, Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar, integrated with the award-winning Intangents methodology of Ross. Visit Habitalism.me to register now for this free life-transforming program endorsed by the United Nations established University for Peace. Gifted by Guardian Group. Live easy. with Gutha Natasha. Reality Radio, at its best, 
where every life is a biography. Sundays, 10 a.m., exclusively on i95.5 FM. And stream live on our Pendency Facebook page and YouTube channel. Thank you, folks. Thank you for staying with us. Let's go one time and we thank. Um, we just got some really nice information here that we didn't know at all about this concerning the crop duster and the pilot. Um, you know, he was a Scotsman, married a Trinidadian, um, father in law of uh, Roger Hamill Smith. And um, the, he, he bossed it. He said, I said, he retired in July and he gone. He's saying that current market. That's it. He, but he um, was a very interesting encounter he had. He, you know, just curious to find out what happened in Tetra and he got a handful. Yes. Um, folks, we have Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Salandi online. Before we speak with him, let's play a clip. Natasha, um, can we have the clip there? That oh gosh. Um, it was only. Did you see a clip? All right. Uh, no, we don't. Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Salandi stood up yes. and he said um let's hear it from his own words good morning colonel good morning good morning sir thank you thank you very me. much for joining us and we appreciate you you know your patience and sitting there listening to the conversation we have in studio lou jones and 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 babel you know strangers to you as well your i remember you saying to Rex Asal and Rafik Shah, that thing in Tetum Barks, you are not a part of this. Why did you feel that way? Because we heard the listeners who your account last week, but tell us, why did you, you grew up here, a huge pair of, of um, that is a major phone. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is what we just calling the army damage. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just a major ringtone. <laughs> oh so we can excuse that. I'm sorry, we discuss it. Let's start the whole Harrison phone. Welcome. There's a, as you can see, hello to Babel and, and, and Majors at the same time. Go ahead, sir. Oh, well, this incident happened, wasn't it, in the morning, it was at 5.30 on Tuesday, 21st of April, 1970. That is after the, the soldiers came back, those who were out on the trucks, after Coast Guard stopped them, and they came back to get them. This is when the, the broader battalion all in about 5.30, which I responded. They had approximately about 180 people there. Soldiers. They had officers, they had sergeants, they had about two sergeants there. And that is when Mr. Lassa addressed us. And he said, all who want to go to Port of Spain and help the Black Brothers suffer in the streets, falling on my right, and who against falling on my left. No move for a period of time. Cut this again. When he said the second time, he said to him, I see Mr. Lassan, Sir, I am not with you all. I want to go home. So then Mr. Shah wasn't too far. He, he, he called me and he said to me, So when the oh, oh, rock, he called me rock, Sergeant. Why? Why you don't want to get us? I said, let me tell you something. I say, from the information received from acting the, the second in command of the square, when we mentioned a emergency, if it was an organized thing, 
you would have had officers speaking to the men, wrong situation, explaining the whole thing, well, you know, that type of thing. This is disorganized, I am no part of it. And then he asked a soldier to take the names of all who on one side and that. Eventually, I must admit that there's a soldier by the name of John P. I'll call his name because he eventually take a little step, 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 and give a post. But when, when I said that, I must also tell you that someone cock a, a general purpose machine gun aiming at me. But I saw who the person was, but there was no fear, no fear in whatever I did. I, I made a quick appreciation of the situation, and I said it's two things. You're either with them or you're not with them, but I'm not with them. And that is what happened. Now that that was a that was a, a a very brave thing to do. It was something that you know you you, you should be commended in doing because you are faced with with mutinous and you just decide you don't want to pass and you stood up for country and of course you 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 remember the oath that you took and but it was a very brave move yes i was thinking of self and country at the time how how, how do you feel about the the, the preservation of this and these events and what what you think should be added to the, the, this should be a part of our national discussion and, and from schools because I, I, I rather raise that point. Um, in, in 2012, at NATO, there was a, a panel discussion on 1970 mutiny. The university did it, I remember quite well. Um, Major McCullen's daughter, Dr. McCullen, she was was one of the persons in charge of that. I was rather surprised to see something like that. Only had about three or four officers from the regiment and, mm -hmm. and the Coast Guard, something like that. I was rather surprised. Mm -hmm. They had the chief of defense staff and maybe one or two senior officers, something like that. And what we were speaking about there at that panel was, was, was General Brown, Admiral Kellershaw, and we're talking just what transpired in that room. Yes, thank you. So that was all I said. Right. You know, some, someone is saying here, point. someone is saying here on Facebook that it is sad that this part of history is not taught in our schools. My adult children and their friends were obviously uh, absolutely shocked when I told them about 1970. They only know about 1990. Um, again, you, you, you really, um, you know. I, I, I think, as I said to the admiral, I think 19, the 21st of April every year should be a significant day, not only to Trinidad and Tobago, but to the Trinidad and Tobago Defence Force. Don't you think so? I think so. Sure. And and you should have been given. Have you received a national award for your stance and not wanting to be part of the subversive elements of our society? I never Back received then? a national award because I can't give myself a national award. Of I course, again, the national award. Right. You should recognize what they if they will get so the kind of we play the game for national award. You also went. You attended every court martial, and and you know you. Every you... I give wow. evidence. I recall what, what, what one day one of the court martials. Um, Colonel Dan Juma was the president, and one Mills Odui from I think Nigeria mm -hmm. was the judge advocate. And in court, when you call somebody name, you need to go and talk to him and point them out. And I remember looking at that and I had fifteen minutes. So I walked in and, and they were trying to trip me while I was walking through the path to go to, to, to point them out. And a soldier mentioned, when we come out from here, we're going to kill the grass on your lawn and wood. And I was scared about it. And what I will tell you, 
after we got released, that was in um, 1972, I recall well, I was having a drink in the arcade. A lot of you all know the arcade um, of Frederick, between Frederick and Henry Street. There was a place in there they called Frenchies. Frenchies. A lot of soldiers were there. And yeah, I recall all of them having a lot of drink. And this guy will release a thing the day before. So a number of them came inside the, the guys who were in jail, eh? the soldiers. They came in there. And they met me. And they come and they speak with me as normal. I bought them a drink. They bought me a drink. <laughs> and as everything else went back. Some oh. of them said, Colonel, no, I was a staff sergeant. They spoke the truth. No, this is this is um so that we would once again like to thank you very much for the part that you played or did not play in supporting 1970. And we really hope one day before you pass, before you leave this earth, that you are recognized for that. Um we make no bones about it, is that loyalty is something and you quite understand what the Ellen Soldier stood for. And your loyalty to your country, your loyalty to your unit. And um, we thank you very much. Lou Jones wanted to say, you want to say something, Colonel? No. I don't want to say anything to him. What I want to say, I heard him saying that he stopped on the roadway there and put up, and, um, did, it was 05 13 in the morning. And I was well, present yeah. there. In the afternoon. It, it, no, it, it, wasn't in the the after, it wasn't in the afternoon, sir. I was most present there. And I saw it there. And I said, wasn't it? It was, our, it was after they were released from the um, prison and they were planning, making plans to get out of the camp in convoy and they wanted to know who going and who staying. I was in the morning, it was around nine. No, well, I, 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 will, I will do that because I recall quite clearly the guys coming back from the hill, they came to the sergeant's mess. A number of the, the civilian workers came to the sergeant mess. And after the, the arrest of the sergeants and all type of thing, I made the sergeant mess was, was um, Sergeant King, Staff Sergeant Apple White, and myself and Ramna Ryan. We remained near till the bugle blow around 5 5 30. And people must up outside the medical room. I will get that and I will say it over again. Oh, gentlemen, hold on, Lou. Uh, you see, the thing about it, this is this is where we go back to. We clarifying something. Back there. in the day, I blame those folks back then because you had a court martial that word for word spoken and documented. From there, everything should have been chronicled and put in place. So this is why today, because remember, in Franklin Brown's contribution, he spoke about a helicopter coming, but it. No, no. It will yeah, play. Exactly. So understand that count history yeah. years later, you know. Have it, you, yes, yeah. of course. And and so let's not um you know beat I up on know, each I, other. I'm not sure you know but we were on the roadway facing the dining hall that morning. Right. Just in front of the reverse, we they they, they, they blew up falling and everybody stood up there after they were released from the prison. And they stood up on the road, everybody falling on the roadway. So oh yeah, last who is commanding officer everything that day, and he was standing up there and saying the, the thing is that he was planning to leave the camp. He said not safe, and questions were being asked where are we going to. He said we're going to Camp Ogden, and we will get instruction from there. And all who on his side and all who want to leave, or who did if who don't want to leave, and then I saw. Um, well, he got staff sergeant, so Landy raised up his right hand and said, it happened right on the road. I don't know, I didn't think it happened in front of the, the medical institution. But I remember it clearly, vividly. It was before the convoy left. Right. And you see, so and the convoy are... didn't leave till almost midday. They took too, they took too long yeah, to leave. Yeah. But I don't want to sound like an argument. But maybe he, he, right, maybe, I don't know. But I remember that. And I, I remember that they, 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 while we were there, somebody was moving in the grass in the bush and was making noise in the grass there while Lafsal was talking. And um, 
they say somebody moving and he ran here. Hearing any little grass, somebody moving, and then the song stopped. Then when he started talking, it started again. He says, some, whoever in the bush hiding there, come out. And the person want to move. They stop moving, and then they hear them move again, like they're trying to take cover. I uh, hear a man, Cockal, uh, SLR. The man was Parkinson. When he cracked the SLR, the man, oh God, oh God, my mother, my mother, oh God, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. It turned out that it was um, this guy who used to drive, he was in the band too, but it was a young band man, it was his younger brother. I do remember him right now, but he crawled out from in the bush and he called he was almost crying. Young soldier, young soldier. Um, his brother was a jumpy, jumpy well, fellow. I, I, I don't want us to run the time that was the same time that that happened that morning. I don't want, I want us to run the time before we go to Kenneth. Uh, look, at least part two, we will do part of Kenneth's construction. But Major, when you say something, yes, um, well, I say good to the colonel, my old commanding officer. One thing I remember about you, sir, apart from knowing you as quartermaster. In charge of the court and thing. One of the things I remember vividly is that the day you got commissioned, it's about eleven hundred hours. Between ten and eleven hundred hours that day, I saw you as a staff sergeant. We had a parade at thirteen, <laughs> and then I saw you, two people commanding a detachment. I never forget that. <laughs> <Come this hour. laughs> I know. I never forget that. <laughs> Yeah, same I have good day, memories of him day. too. I have good memories same of him day. too as a staff sergeant. And I, as a young soldier, uh, uh, when he came up home by me, uh, a Sunday morning in South Hill, and he said, I heard a loud voice of the old lady saying, Lou, I hear somebody calling you out there. I hear Lou Jones, Private Jones. It's Bayer, you know, Bayer, quite by the corner in the Jeep. Yeah, yeah, loud, you, loud. He had the loudest voice. <laughs> when I go out in the front of my house there, and I said, I'm pull up in the Jeep. Let's go to Tetron. Let's go down on the base. Join the field now. So there were a lot of young soldiers was in the army about less than a year. He said, we're going down to Tetron. Going down on the base. So, so I had to get dressed and join the vehicle. It's crab the uh, crime in the kitchen. Uh, so, so the colonel... He was having a curry. After I was that, the crab man. I've been so with him in various... <laughs> Good, good and officer. Just, um, assignments, including Think patrol, bush patrol. Experience with. Yeah. Then eventually, I was his uh, major when he was commanding officer the VDF. Yeah. And I always admire him as a commanding officer. Good man. Yes, that's, that's, that's he stood in 1970. If you're wrong, you'll tell you you're wrong for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what I, what I, I, I right support my you. experience, my experience, I, I could tell you with Ray Admiral Kelchel and Colonel Salandi, <laughs> unfortunately he wasn't on the good side of things. But um I still man respect Colonel Salandi and I am calling on all the veterans association of Trinidad and Tobago. We will do it as well. We need to write to the awards committee in Trinidad and Tobago so that Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Salandi can be recognized for his stance and his contribution in 1970 of course. preserving our nation's history. This is something we just cannot dismiss. If the regiment want to do it, the Defense Force, will, at least we have veterans associations that can do it. Let us write and recognize. Don't wait till he dies and then everybody you not know, going to be calling radio station and getting song by on TV and oh yes, I remember the Colonel and even yeah, serving members now will want to talk about it. Let us not do that. Attired CS do things that way. Let us recognize this gentleman for what he did. And I... I blow no trumpet for the colonel, you know. He's the one who charged me, you know. <laughs> I, I, I was taking the colonel salary. He took my papers to Major General Ralph Brown, and I was discharged. So I suppose I have he off, you know. Nah. But no, I can't do that because I could separate my issues. And one, he was doing his job. No. I cannot let that overshadow what he did for this country. Ladies and gentlemen, represented President Colonel when Salan retired, who stood for yeah, loyalty yeah, in Trinidad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good man. Yeah. I have good my good, good memories on him. Let us do it. Let us not let this just slip away. Gentlemen. Honor him before he go. Yes, honor him before he go. Don't wait till he go, then everybody. Waiting to get that song in the news. 
yes no let us stop <laughs> doing things that way and again we were like to have that day the 24th of april every year Trinidad and Tobago, we recognize for what it is, just as we do for 1990. Yes. There's nothing to be a and go. To the U.S. Memorial Day and Independence Day and all these things. What happened to ours? What happened to ours? It happened. But, we cannot change what happened. Yeah, but you know, older soldiers, those, those who are alive still, I don't know if they still do, those who were involved in 1970 soldiers, um, Shah, and those guys, they on that day they used to have a thing. They used to meet. Yeah, every yeah, year, every year they, they met. Yeah. yeah, but I think COVID kind of put a damper on that. Yeah, of course, they're know? dying one by one. I want yeah, to mention transmission. Yes, <laughs> I would um, like I would like to mention too one of them was the youngest player of my batch of 1966. Ian Johnson. He died last week. Last week. Yes, yes Johnson. Uh, yes, he was part of the his daughter Nicole. Mm -hmm. and so on and on the other hand we have one who celebrated our birthday today another batch bishop oh. wish all the best too okay he was arrested in 19 in 1972 you know uh -huh. well you know there are a lot of people who were innocent that were arrested uh -huh. he was one of them and then they released him today is his birthday yes he would have happy, birthday. happy birthday gentlemen i'm happy colonel stay batch. right there gentlemen let's hear natasha should we go to part two I just want to hear Kenneth Luke and the Luke family. We were in another time, but it would be remiss of us if we did not allow this contribution to be had. Yeah, I think we could, we could, if we have to do one, let's, let's go with part two. Let's go with part two. Yeah. Now, let me just set this up. The Luke family, they made this fight. Nobody, for some reason, saw it fit to get them out. But um, even Colonel Luke, I felt, for long on the job. This is my opinion. Because you know what was about to happen, you know what was about to go down. I think you should have gotten this from the other day. Jack, um, when we, yes. William, he came up and he out. said, Maggie, you're still here, get out, get out now. Yeah. Why didn't he make sure to get them out of there? They were left to for the eldest son who you're about to hear, Kenneth Luke, get his family out of harm way yeah. before anything happened. And if you all know where that was situated it was the only space that the Coast Guard had to engage the regiment and that house was right above those trucks. Yep. Um let's hear from Ken quickly. Part two. Part two short one. As I was racing down the hill between those first and second one-way bridges, we got around some rubble and large boulders that had come down in the road. But across the second one-way bridge, a coast guard was blocking it on the downhill side. All I could think of was escape, 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 and that wasn't coming easy. I first tried to squeeze past the back of the bus and the hill, and that was useless, and then looked at passing the wagon at the front of the bus but there was not enough space to pass as the front almost overhung cliff down to the sea. I am guessing they considered stopping even a jeep passing. We couldn't do anything else and frantically we got out of the car and began to run. Run towards Stobles. My four-year-old sister was on my shoulders. Jerry was trying to come out of the back of the car screaming, Don't leave me! Please, y'all, don't leave me! Mom grabbed him and Gertrude and my younger sister were trembling and crying and running towards the second reality of our possible death. As the Coast Guard had created what looked like a crossfire zone right at the lowest point of the parking lot and behind the trees and the inside of the Coast Guard fence, and I saw seamen with large guns along the road behind Mr. Daniel. So we were running and calling out, it's Luke, it's Luke, Luke from up the hill. I remember a Coast Guard officer, to my memory it was Jack Williams, who shouted, Hold fire! Hold fire! Then a chief petty officer, I cannot remember his name, came to our aid as the officer was telling Mom, Maggie, we can take you and the children up to Port of Spain on a cutter. But she chose to ask him to move the bus enough so that I could pass instead. 
I went back up the hill there with the chief, one ordinary seaman and another in a jeep that was reversed up the hill. As the ordinary seaman angled the bus so the car would pass behind it, there were another two booms, close and deafening loud this time, and I think the hill came down big this time, because I'd hear breaking trees and plenty big stones come down that hill. The chief grabbed the keys from me and shouted, Get in! All of you all, get in the car! And as the ordinary seaman moved the bus, I got into the wagon, passenger side, back seat. As the space opened up enough, the chief drove behind the bus. What we didn't know was that as they lay dead or dying on that hill, we were likely to be next. The jeep was moving slowly, going down the hill. As the ordinary seaman who moved the bus jumped into the back of the wagon and because the car was line of fire, as it went round the last curve, two rounds hit the car. One put a hole in the tailgate, the other came through the large back window on the driver's side and went across the car into the back of the front passenger seat. Although it was a green vehicle, that was a civilian vehicle and everybody knew the car and its owners. But since nobody was hurt, the Coast Guard fellas helped mom, Gertrude and the children back into the car and we ran like hell. I mean the fright had me so I drew like I was the madman this time. Most of the way out, I kept my eyes on the rearview mirror. All of us were quiet and I guess in shock, very nervous, as we zigzagged past all the oil drums and where there were old iron obstacles in the road. I drove in the grass from Swan Hunter all the way to the convention center, sometimes using the shoulder. Curiously, when we passed the main gate, I don't think I remembered seeing army or police and didn't feel to look back either through Karanaj, which looked like a ghost town with little traffic and peak movement, all the way to drop Gertrude to her son's house in Dago Martin and then to a friend's house, which was on high ground in Pity Valley. So we stayed there ducking and hiding, avoiding skyline of the porch wall and front and back windows for a few days. As night and day military jeeps raced back and forth on Moncook Road, men with guns standing in the back, and we could see lights moving in Digo Hills at night. The thought was, those were disloyal escape soldiers. Because of that increased activity in the area, we were moved under police guard to a home of another family friend and senior civil servant, where there were 24 by 7 police on guard. It was still dangerous as the military searches continued, and we could not initially go out. We didn't know who was who, and while we were close to a well-placed roadblock, we kept an eye, especially at night, on the activity there. So I didn't get much sleep. Most of us didn't get sleep. Somebody brought clothes, etc. and things began to settle down. My 16-year-old sister hugged herself, trembling and shaking from side to side for the first week there. While my 11-year-old brother was never further than two to three feet from mom, he slept under the bed with his and and holding her for more than one year. Long afterwards, we jokingly referred to that as his don't leave me moments. But for the next two weeks, we all were very quiet while the four-year-old baby cried a lot. Mom was so strong. She was so very strong. And I understood why my father saw what he saw in her. We children never saw our father for weeks, and mom didn't know where he was other than he originally told her he would be posted. But once that place burned to the ground, I think he was moving about under different orders, but we never knew for sure. I thought she spoke to him by telephone a couple times in the night and saw him sometime around our third week in hiding, because I think he came very early one morning. I didn't understand it then, but I do understand now, as his staying away deliberate. I think by then we had gotten wind that all our private possessions at PP3 were stolen or deliberately damaged, and in tatters, a home ransacked and a family of civilians put to rout. Not surprising when civilian workers were used as human shields to cover for the big egos and handsome weaponry, sort of like the character Mongoose protecting the Bushmaster, ludicrous and entirely criminal. What do you think?
It's also chilling to hear a previous contributor, a fellow called Lou Jones, in one of these serial broadcasts, confirm that soldiers who raided that house at PP3 in search of my family, Luke and them, as we were referred to, and if we were found there, they would bust us up. It confirms that there was malintent of people trying to convince Trinidad and Tobago that there was no intent for bloodshed. And to this day, 50 years later, confirmation by his own words, who was driving this thing. It is plausible there could have been more bloodshed, and in this case, civilian bloodshed. But we escaped with our lives, because besides the angry tagalongs made useful by feeding on their grouse, when you give soldiers ultimatum in illegal orders, especially young soldiers using words to the effect, those with us over here and those who not with us over there, it tells me that fear drove that choice and many got caught up as they didn't have the military maturity that Salandi demonstrated. Today, it is clear that the population had no idea how close the nation came to alternate governance, styled after the contents of that little red book. As a family, we returned to the house at PP3 Shagaramas between three to four months after. Tall grass and small trees in the yard were almost man height, and we had to cut a path to the door to get in. Spite work vandalizing our home was evident. Furniture was damaged, and my father's recliner in the living room, expletives were cut into the back of the chair. Curtains were torn down, and in the patio, the canvas cover was cut up and pulled down, plus the gramophone, the records, and TV were gone. Lou Jones confirmed that this was done, and curiously, the stolen gramophone of an officer, who was continually ill-spoken, offered the camp some comfort. One wonders how Lou Jones knows this so vividly. The inside of the house was destroyed and possessions and any official documents lost. Paper everywhere scattered over the floors. Bedroom, furniture and mattresses turned upside down and everything was ransacked. The fridge was unplugged. It appeared purposely and consequently it filled with maggots. As the week before the mutiny, mom did grocery and it was packed with meat and other perishables. As testimony to the vandals, that thing was so slimy, I think. We put it in the air and tried to hose it out. It was eventually replaced, as we couldn't get it clean. The symbology of that fridge reminds me today of the stink that remains of this event. The smell of decay just cannot come out. From then, I guess we began recreating our lives, starting cleaning up. We didn't get official help, and I assumed my father thought he didn't need any. An alarm came by a few times after and helped us. He was a childhood friend of my uncle's in Tobago. I think it was Hippolyte who also came by, but he may have been my father's driver at the time, with no official military help to my recollection, and it took about two to three weeks to clean up and replace beds, etc., but all valuables were gone. What hit me specifically is that when Dad returned from military training in the UK in late 1969, he brought a solid gold watch as a present for an early 21st birthday gift from my godfather, who was also his brother. And I never got to wait. That was gone too. As we cleaned the place, my parents were visibly shaken, as they had felt this pain before. Our family experienced total loss before, as two floods ravaged their lives in late 50s, early 60s days in our family home in Pitifali. What's interesting is that none of the other military families in saw what we saw and had these experiences. We felt alone and left to ourselves to handle all of this. I then left Trinidad and Tobago for university abroad in 1972. I, I am, I, I, I don't want to think that we're going to have to do this like we did the last time eh? because we planned just two programs the last occasion we ended up doing 11 parts and now that we have Lou Jones here and the comments made by my missus Luke um you know I'm sorry we don't have we, we don't have time, we don't have time to really debate it yeah. but let me just show this before we you have gentleman Carlton from um retired by General Carl Alfonso you're listening to you all he says good morning yeah. and around the knowledge thank you one for military history and courses in Trinidad Regiment. 
by him as well and safely and I'd safely say that our soldiers are informed of the actions of 1970. However, just one thing to add, former Colonel, former C after Colonel Johnson was escorted to the area where the FHU is now, if not the very night, probably he had not long after, but he's still alive today. I think he's 102 or something oh, like that. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, right. I did it strip him, it is strip him my, yeah, I'm thinking of. Is wrong? Right. They said that. He was cashed. Yes, he was. Sure. But folks, that, um, From so you heard, let, let's throw this on the table. And gentlemen, we could probably arrange for another Sunday where we could continue this discussion. One thing we like to throw on the table, Colonel Solandi, you, you could have your final say in a moment. This family, the Luke family. Oh, sorry, Alpha, it wasn't um, Brigadier. It was his son. Son? W2. Okay, okay. And I'm sorry, I apologize. No um, but we, that, you see that corner? Luke? Where Luke lived mm -hmm. and Bailey dying there, mm -hmm. we we always felt that you know the defense force could do something about that corner and call it maybe the Bailey Luke Bailey corner. Bailey where he got Bailey corner. Lower, right, there but it's the postcard. same area, right? Yeah. yeah. Area. So I mean, yards down. You know, right. you don't be deep. Have a little bit in that deep corner. Come it's a day. <laughs> no, but come closer. Come closer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he died lower down near the deep corner there. Right. So, right, so just in front of him. I mean, we cannot action the, the, you know, the defense force, but we humbly request that this family, especially the Luke family, they, I, I don't know, in my mind, gentlemen, and those of you listening, I always felt that they could have been evacuated yes. before that convoy came up the hill. Because if we had time to play the first part, you would hear Kenneth talk about they heard the trucks actually started and started coming up the hill. Yeah, they, line up and they were lined up waiting to come up the hill. Really and and the men were running all in the yard and on top of their house. And you name it, they were in the middle of this thing. But you will have to appreciate at that point in time, when the trucks were lined up ready to evacuate Tetron, there was no way that they could evacuate the Luke family, except bringing them into Tetron back. Right. Or oh, before okay. that. Bef before, remember, he spoke about, and, and I'm sorry, we didn't get a chance to play that. He said when, when Commodore Williams, Williams came back, came back because remember, they lived side by side. Yeah. And when Moving Williams looked at the house, he said, Maggie, you all still here? Get out, get out now. Now, even before that, Colonel Luke went home and told them, look, you all don't go to work. Nobody leave home because something about to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point, he should have been proactive mm. because he was going to Ogden and time. get them out one time as he was leaving. Yep. No, well, he was skating. Maybe he was skating the state of emergency yeah. against what was happening in Tetron Bar. I believe so. I, I believe so. He should have impacted what was at going the same on. At the time, he should have Tetron. even make a call and get them out. Get them out. Call yeah. Tetron. Yeah. Or call Stubbles and say, look, my family is still there. Please get them out. He, yeah. Remember, Colonel, Colonel, he's a, he's a member of the mess. Correct. He, even after... The thing died down, and he was out stationed at the time, and they was they was spending the dinner, as you say. Yeah. And he should have made a ring, and he had power, he had the authority to ask them to cut the grass and clean the house and check it out before he sent back his family there. That too, yeah, that he spoke too. about Rather that too. Rather than just yeah. telling them go back down there, to relive that trauma, right? So I, I blame him for that too. Um, Colonel Salandi. Be, any think, final word because we just have three minutes so say you have 30 seconds to give us your final comment before we wrap up we have major news at 12 come up so over to you colonel all right my final comment is that i mean the discipline should be maintained in the defense force as we know it in this. so defense for personal honesty Integrity, they will be able to speak to people properly and maintain standards. That's how it used to be. That's all I have to say right now.
We want to thank you for giving of your time this morning and helping us with this journey. And we hope that our wish for you receiving a national award will happen before you leave this earth. You played a tremendous role in our history, and we thank you for that. God bless you and the family. You served well. You served us well. Okay. Yes. Okay, sir. Um, gentlemen, 30 seconds. Closing remarks. Yes, I would like to um to hear or hear or let everybody else hear my response to Luke's um, statement that I was part of the mutiny and was jumping on and off the truck and, and entered his house and, and, and took the belongings and I admitted that we took the radio program I, and my oh. statement is there on record. I said what I had to say about the radio program that make get that response and I, at no time I said we took it from the right hood. The morning that we were in the in the back room around five o'clock, I heard the music coming from another section of the back room downstairs. Otis Redding singing, "I was born by the river." Remember that song? Yes. I said, "Where they come in this song?" When I walk up to the thing, I said, "That like a river, valley, but it's singing good." It's a radiogram in the corner. They when I asked, they said I made a little radiogram. I said, I see how they, they bring it down from the hill. They went up to the house and bring the man radiogram down here. I never said I was there part of it in my statement that we took the radiogram from Colonel Luke's house. Right. What I said about Colonel Luke, I had to say, and is the truth. Right, gentlemen, uh, we have to wrap up. Uh, Major, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. I would like you to play the response I did yeah, at my time. And we always talk to we talk about the volunteer defense force and the role that they played in the, that program as well. Yes. Yes. They they, mm -hmm. they played as well. They were the reserves. Yes. At so, the time they stood up. So gentlemen, to we have to occasion. make way for yes. major, major news, news at, at 12. 12. Mr. Daily Knock. Yes. Thank you once again. We have five seconds to leave the studio. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you very much for your time. Major news up next at 12 with Mr. Daily Knock.